Good evening and uh, welcome to this UHI lecture. The last time we were in Eden Court was in 2002 for our first annual lecture, which on that occasion was delivered by Lord Putnam, David Putnam, the filmmaker. And it's wonderful to be back here today in the newly refurbished Eden Court. Eden Court's at the centre of sustaining and promoting the arts in Inverness and the Highlands, just as UHI is at the centre of sustaining and developing and promoting higher education throughout the Highlands and Islands of Scotland. So this evening, it's therefore a very happy concurrence for UHI to be hosting this lecture here in Eden Court. Richard Dawkins, Professor Dawkins, needs little or no introduction from me. All the tickets for tonight's event were taken up within four days. His most popular book, The God Delusion, has been translated into 31 languages and in its English version alone has sold 1.5 million copies. But while Richard Dawkins is presently most famous for his views on religion, he originally made his reputation as a distinguished scientist. For many academics and others of my generation, his 1976 book, The Selfish Gene, was seminal. And underpinning all of Richard's work is a commitment to the scientific method and to evidence-based reasoning. Richard was born in Nairobi in Kenya in 1941 and lived there for eight years before the family returned to England. He studied zoology at Balliol College, Oxford, where he was tutored by the Nobel Prize winning ethologist Nicholas Tinbergen, graduating in 1962. He continued his studies at Oxford, gaining his DPhil degree in 1966. Briefly, he then taught at the University of California at Berkeley from 1967 to 1969 before returning to Oxford. And this is the one bit of his career I don't quite understand, leaving San Francisco and Berkeley in 1969 seems a wrong move. And I say that from experience, I went to the States in 1969 as a graduate student, albeit to the East Coast. And of course, we were the generation at that time of students who didn't inhale. <laughs> Back at Oxford, Richard's career continued apace. Uh, originally appointed as a lecturer in zoology, he then became the Charles Simonyi Professor for the Public Understanding of Science in 1995. This position has provided Richard with a platform to promote his commitment to the scientific method and to evidence-based reasoning. Awards and accolades have followed. He has honorary degrees from the University of Westminster, the University of Durham, the University of Hull, the Open University, the Free University of Brussels, our own St Andrews University, and the Australian National University. In 2001, he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society. This evening's event takes a format we've used before to good effect. Richard will engage, first of all, in a conversation with Paula Kirby for about 40 minutes. Paula Kirby has lived in the Highlands for about seven years. She describes herself as a former uh, Christian and now a committed atheist and an active supporter of Richard Dawkins and his views. We think this conversation format will work. It'll allow Richard to present his views and what I think he's described to me as a, a series of lecturettes. In other words, we hope this format will allow Richard to cover the broad range of his work and concerns. This will then be followed by a question and answer session conducted by the redoubtable Gary Robertson. We of course consider Gary to be one of our own since he hails from Elgin. And Gary himself has had a distinguished career with the BBC, covering the Oscars in Los Angeles, working for the World Service, and producing the Sony award-winning Eddie Mayer live show before returning to Scotland. Most of us, of course, start the day with Gary. He tells us what's going on in the world through Good Morning Scotland on BBC Radio.
Gary has been instructed to forensically examine the views expressed by Richard and to ensure that as many of you as possible get the opportunity to ask the question you most want an answer to. So that's our speaker and our interrogators. So can I now ask uh, Gary Robertson to come on stage to explain a little more about the format. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Eden Court Theatre. Well, as Bob was saying there, our format is that Richard will have a conversation with Paula for around 40 minutes, and then we'll have an hour or so to get through as many of your questions as possible, and that's where I come in trying to get as many of you to, to ask questions and getting Richard, hopefully, to give you as thorough an answer as possible. Now, you'll see, looking around the room, that we've got some microphones set up for you to ask those questions. I'd ask you, as the conversation comes to an end, if you'd like to ask a question, to make your way to one of the microphones. Obviously, we won't be able to hear you unless you're at one of those. So there are microphones in the main auditorium at either side here, and then upstairs we have microphones, again, pretty much in the same position on each of those levels. So once the conversation is coming to an end, if you'd make your way to the microphones and you'll hopefully get your chance to ask your questions in the hour that we have allotted to us. So without further ado, could we welcome to the stage Paula Kirby and Professor Richard Dawkins. Thank you very much for that, and uh, I'd just like to add my own welcome to Richard, and thank you very much for coming to Inverness today. It's great to have you here. Uh, we're going to plunge straight in. Uh, Richard, these days, as Bob was saying, you're probably best known for your book, The God Delusion. Um, created quite a stir with that. We're going to come on and talk about that later, and I'm sure the audience will have a thing or two to say about it, too. Um, but before that, you were best known, I think, and you're still very well known as a scientist who is so passionate about science and is able to express it and to convey the excitement of science even to a non-scientific audience, what is it about science that thrills you so much and makes you so excited about it? Science is true. By the way, I should apologize for my voice. I've lost it. <laughs> I don't know whether God has something to do with it, but <laughs> I like to think it's become sexy and husky, but I fear that's a bit of wishful thinking. Science is the truth about reality. It's the truth about the real world in which we are fortunate enough to find ourselves. We are especially fortunate to find ourselves here in the 21st century, living after Galileo, after Newton, after Einstein, after Max Planck, after Darwin, after Watson and Crick. That means that the picture of the world that we have to savour is more wonderful, richer, fuller than it was for any of our predecessors. It's an amazing privilege to be living at this time when science hasn't got all the answers, but has got a really surprisingly and remarkably long way towards getting answers to understand why we exist, what the universe is all about, what life is all about. I feel thankful to be living at this time. And can you describe for us uh, perhaps one or two of the, the odder things that science has, has revealed and things that are particularly exciting and that particularly excite you? One of the oddest things that's happened really during my professional lifetime is the acceptance of plate tectonics. Mm. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, it was known as continental drift, and it was associated with the name of a German meteorologist called Wegener. And Wegener was pretty much ridiculed. What he noticed was that if you look at the outline of the west coast of Africa and the east coast of, of South America, and indeed the, the whole um, of the east side of North America as well, they make rather a neat fit. And he suggested that once upon a time, those two continents were abutting, they were joined up together. It was pretty much ridiculed, and when I was an undergraduate, my lecturer in ecology, Charles Elton, actually had a vote among us undergraduates. Voting is not, by the way, how scientists decide issues. <laughs> but nevertheless, I'm sorry to say he did this, and we were, we were split about 50-50. Since that time, 
in the guise of the theory of plate tectonics, uh, it is now absolutely accepted. There's no, not a shadow of a doubt that over the last hundred million years or so, uh, South America and Africa have been gradually pulling apart. They were once touching. They've been pulling apart. It's been said at the speed with which fingernails grow. If that doesn't make the hair curl on the back of your neck, I don't know what will. Once upon a time, South America and Africa were touching. and They've gradually been pulling apart, pulling apart, and pulling apart. The evidence for it is totally conclusive. Uh, probably there isn't time to go in, into it, but obviously it's of the kind of evidence that you can't see directly. It's rather like a detective coming upon the scene of a crime after it's happened. You can't actually see the murder being committed, but what you can see is all the clues that remain. And in the case of plate tectonics, in the case of continental drift, the clues that remain are so overwhelmingly conclusive that nobody could any longer doubt it. And by the way, it completely knocks on the head the absurd idea that the Earth is only a, a, a few thousand years old. Thank you for that. I've actually got a different example of something from your books that made the hair on the back of my leg stand up. And uh, I've given it to you there as, as a reading, which I'm going to ask you to do if your voice can take it. Um, and I'll tell you what it is. It's from a book called A Devil's Chaplain. It's where you describe the atomic structure of crystals. And this was something I have to say here. I'm no scientist at all. And uh, it was only reading Richard's books that made me take an interest in it at all. And actually, this was probably the first thing I read that made me think, oh, that actually is really interesting. And, and not only is it really interesting, but I can understand that. And because that had such a, a great effect on me, I'd like to ask you to, to read that for us now, if you would. I'll give it a go. If my voice starts to fail, I might hand it over to Paul to, to, to read. <laughs> In a crystal, such as quartz or diamond, the atoms are arranged in a precisely repeating pattern. The atoms in a diamond, all identical carbon atoms, are arrayed like soldiers on parade, except that the precision of their dressing far outsmarts the best drilled guards regiment, and the atomic soldiers outnumber all the people that have ever lived or ever will. Imagine yourself shrunk to become one of the carbon atoms in the heart of a diamond crystal. You are one of the soldiers in a gigantic parade, but it'll seem a little odd because the files are arrayed in three dimensions. Perhaps a prodigious school of fish is a better image. Each fish in the school is one carbon atom. Think of them hovering in space, keeping their distance from each other and holding their precise angles by means of forces that you can't see but which scientists fully understand. But if this is a fish school, it is one that, to scale, would fill the Pacific Ocean. In any decent-sized diamond, you are likely to be looking along arrays of atoms numbering hundreds of millions in any one straight line. The military metaphor makes us think of each soldier as a meter or so from his neighbors. But actually, almost all the interior of a crystal is empty space. My head is 18 centimeters in diameter. To keep to scale, my nearest neighbors in the crystalline parade would have to be standing more than a kilometer away. But if solid things are mostly empty space, why don't we see them as empty space? Why does a diamond feel hard and solid instead of crumbly and full of holes? The answer lies in our own evolution. Our sense organs, like all our bits, have been shaped by Darwinian natural selection over countless generations. You might think that our sense organs would be shaped to give us a true picture of the world, as it really is. It is safer to assume that they've been shaped to give us a useful picture of the world, to help us to survive. In a way, what sense organs do is assist our brains to construct a useful model of the world, and it is this model that we move around in. It is a kind of virtual reality simulation of the real world. In the same way, we find much of the universe, as science discovers it, difficult to understand. Einstein's relativity, quantum uncertainty, black holes, the Big Bang, the expanding universe, the slow movement of geological time, 
All these are hard to grasp. No wonder science frightens some people. But science can even explain why these things are hard to understand and why the effort frightens us. We are jumped up apes and our brains were only designed to understand the mundane details of how to survive in the Stone Age African savanna. These are deep matters and a short article is not the place to go into them. I shall have succeeded if I persuaded you that a scientific approach to crystals is more illuminating, more uplifting, and also stranger than anything imagined in the wildest dreams of new, new age gurus or paranormal preachers. The blunt truth is that the dreams and visions of gurus and preachers are not nearly wild enough. By scientific standards, that is. <laughs> I challenge anyone to look at a crystal in the same way after that. That's actually a nice lead-in to the next thing I want to ask you. You talked about um, our brains being evolved to view the world in a particular way. Um, evolution is, of course, your specialist subject. <coughs> Can you tell us, tell me, as a complete science beginner, and tell the audience about evolution, what it is, how it works, and more than anything, how can you be so sure that it is right? First of all, let me say why it's important. Because uh, until evolution came along, until we had Darwin, uh, it, the most outstandingly surprising thing about the world would have been the extraordinary complexity of living things and the fact that they looked as though they'd been designed. Nobody could look at an eye or a heart without thinking, gosh, that was pretty cleverly designed to see or to pump, whatever it is. What Darwin did was to show that the illusion of design of something like an eye or a heart can come about through purely mechanical, physical processes without any design whatsoever. And it works like this. I'm going to work backwards. You could easily understand getting an eye from something that was almost an eye. Starting with something that hadn't quite got to the point of being an eye, but almost had. And then once you've got that, you go back a stage further and you could explain how you could get that from something that was almost an almost an eye. And so on, back, 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 through millions of years until you get no eye at all. That's one way of looking at it. The forward way of looking at it is to say, in every generation, this would be Darwin's way, in every generation you have variation which is under genetic control. Not all animals are equally good at surviving. The ones that are best equipped to survive are the ones that do survive and therefore they pass on to the next generation the equipment to survive. Nowadays we would say the genes for building the eyes or whatever it might be. In every generation, some animals are more likely to die than others. Some animals are more likely to reproduce than others. They are the ones that pass on the genes that make them good at surviving and reproducing. In the, whatever particular way the animal concern survives, if it's a a land-dwelling animal, these are genes for running fast, for hunting well, for seeing well, for smelling well. If it's a dolphin or a fish, these are genes for swimming well. If it's a bird, these are genes for flying well. Whatever it takes to survive for the particular species, those animals that do survive will pass on the genes for being good at surviving. Over many, many generations, the, the world becomes more and more full of genes that are good at surviving, good at reproducing. It takes a very, very, very long time. Fortunately, we have a very, very, very long time. Geology gives us approximately four billion years of Earth history since roughly when the origin of life occurred. During that time, life started off perhaps as something rather simpler than a bacterium. It went through the bacterial stage for about the first couple of billion years. It then produced 
rather more complex cells, which are called prokaryotic, sorry, eukaryotic cells, which are the cells that we're made of. The eukaryotic cells club together to form so-called multicellular animals, animals that are made of lots of different cells. At every stage, the progeny generation would not have been noticeably different from the parent generation. You would not have noticed the difference if you'd been there. But if you come back a million years later, you would have noticed the difference. The change is so slow, so imperceptible, that you can't actually see it happening, or you're lucky if you can. In the same way as you can't actually watch a child growing up. And yet you know that after a number of years, the child is noticeably bigger. In the same way, you couldn't actually see evolution happening. But after a million years, you can notice substantial evolutionary change. For example, in a million years since Homo erectus walked the Earth, there have been noticeable changes in the anatomy. Uh, in the uh, 65 million years since the dinosaurs went extinct, most of the mammals have evolved. These are spans of time which is extremely hard for the human brain to grasp, which is one of the reasons why people have such difficulty in understanding evolution. The bottom line is that evolution has given us an explanation which we now know to be the correct explanation, it's factually true, has given us the correct explanation for the existence of the whole of life. And we no longer need to resort to concepts like design. If you want to resort to concepts like design, you can do so if you wish, but only by some kind of circumlocution, such as saying, oh well, the designer chose evolution by natural selection in order to do his designing in a very roundabout, indirect way it was too. Can I take you back for a moment, Richard? You say that we know that this is true. What, what is the evidence for evolution? There are about half a dozen different strands of evidence. <clears throat> For me, the most convincing evidence comes from modern molecular biology. If you, as, as you know, ever since uh, the Watson and Crick revolution from 1953 onwards, we know that all living creatures have in every one of their cells a very long piece of text which is spelled out in letters of DNA. And it's now possible to look at the exact sequence of letters. It's exactly like reading the characters in a book. So you can take any two animals you like, say a mole and an aardvark, or a human and a kangaroo, or a rhinoceros and a baboon. Take any two animals you like, and you can look at the exact sequence of letters in their DNA, and you can compare them letter by letter by letter for billions of letters. This gives you billions and billions of comparisons. And lo and behold, when you do that, when you compare any two, two animals and then any other two animals, and then compare one of those to one of those, one of those to one of those, in a, in a branching tree pattern, a branching tree pattern is exactly what you see. The pattern of resemblances between the code letters in any pair of animals you look at follows exactly the pattern you'd expect if it was a family tree. It is a family tree. Moreover, you can do that for each different gene separately. So you can, you can draw out a family tree for gene A, and you draw out a family tree for all the different animals, then you draw out a family tree for gene B, and lo and behold, it's the same family tree. For gene C, it's the same family tree. Even better, there are lots of genes that don't actually do anything the so-called pseudogenes. They're rather like the, the mess that's on your hard disk. If you look on the hard disk of your computer, bits of the data that are there are words that you have actually, you remember composing. They're part of the, the chapter you're working on, whatever it might be, the letters you're writing. But the, the hard disk is covered with all sorts of other stuff, maybe discarded remnants of old bits of writing, whatever it might be. The equivalent of that in the genome is pseudogenes. 
They're not doing anything. Once upon a time, they probably did do something, but they no longer do. And exactly the same story pertains, exactly the same branching family tree you find, even with these pseudo-genes that aren't doing anything. I think that's the most persuasive evidence for evolution. There's plenty of other evidence. The evidence from the geographical distribution of animals. Animals and plants, if you look at where they are on the islands and continents of the world, which side of mountain ranges they are, which side of rivers they are, they're exactly where they should be. If we were like detectives who'd come on the scene after the event and looked at the clues and said, this is exactly what we should see if evolution had happened. Similarly, the fossil record is exactly what we should see if evolution had happened. Comparative anatomy is exactly what we should see if evolution had happened. There is no longer the slightest shadow of a doubt that evolution is a fact. That's not to say that natural selection, Darwin's theory of evolution, is the only theory that accounts for it. But evolution itself is a fact. It is a fact that we are cousins of monkeys, we are closer cousins of apes, we are more distant cousins of cats, more distant cousins still of octopuses, and so on. <coughs> Creationists, of course, would uh, dismiss evolution altogether because it contradicts the Genesis story of the creation of the world. But there are many Christians um, and other religious people who, who wouldn't do that, who would be perfectly happy to accept evolution as simply being God's way of bringing complex life about. Do you have any thoughts on that? Is that, is that a possibility? Well, I think it is important to make a distinction between uh, the young Earth creationists, who are frankly loonies, just idiots, um, who actually think that the world is only 6,000 years old. I ask you, 6,000 years old, that's equivalent to believing that the width of North America from New York to San Francisco is 7.8 yards. So let's differentiate the idiots on the one hand from the serious Christians who think that the, the, the world really is old and agree that evolution is a fact, but who think that evolution is God's way of doing things. Well, that's not totally stupid. I mean, um, if you were an extremely lazy god, that's the way you'd do it, because you wouldn't have to actually have to do anything at all. Um, all you would have to do would be to start the universe going, and then sit back and watch it all happen. And a fascinating spectator sport, indeed, it would be. <laughs> um, but I must say, as I said before, it, it is a rather um, strange way of going about things. You, you might think that if God were really wanting to make it pretty convincing that he exists, he, would, he wouldn't choose as a way of bringing us into existence the one way which makes it look as though he's not there. So um, it, it, it is a way out, and it's a way out that is adopted by all serious theologians, I mean by bishops and, and archbishops and popes and people. I forgot the Pope's the Antichrist, isn't he? I forgot about that. Um, but it's, it's the way that's adopted by all uh, serious theologians. But as I say, I think it rings pretty hollow. Are there any sort of forms in evolution that would actually seriously argue against that? And I'm thinking in terms of, uh, I mean, nature can be very cruel. Um, and, and we seem to be full of design flaws if, if we were designed at all. Would, would you like to say a word or two about that? There are two points there. But what, one is the cruelty which you just mentioned. Um, when you look at the elegance of the apparent design of, say, a, a cheetah or a lion and the antelopes that they're, that they're hunting, if God has designed both of those, then God has designed the, the lion to be an extremely good antelope killer, and at the same time, God has designed the antelopes to be an extremely good lion escaper. And you sort of wonder, well, whose side is God on? Um, you know, why doesn't he make one side or the other win? Nature is very, very cruel. It's exactly what you would expect if there were no God. You would expect nature to be cruel, because you would expect that antelopes and lions, cats and mice, dogs and rabbits, would be the end products of a long evolutionary arms race in which each one in evolutionary time is pressing the other one just like the arms race between the Russians and the Americans. Each advance on the predator side is countered by an advance on the prey side so that uh, in, 
The end product of the arms race is that both the lions and the antelopes are very, very good at what they do. The lions are extremely good at chasing antelopes. The antelopes are extremely good at escaping from lions. The result is extreme cruelty, extreme pain, extreme fear. And it's precisely what you'd expect if it had come about through evolution by natural selection. The other point you made was the about... Um, design flaws. About um, design flaws. Yes. I was talking about the eye a bit earlier. If you look at the human eye, the retina is backwards. You can think of the, of the retina as being a bank of photocells which are gathering light, and there are millions and millions of them, and each one is reporting on the state of light um, at the surface of the retina where it is, back to the brain. So, if you were a designer making a bank of photocells, you would have all the photocells pointing, as my fingers are, towards the light. But in fact, in the human eye, they're pointing backwards. They're pointing away from the light. The light has to pass through the connecting wires that are connecting the photocell, the backwards pointing photocells. And the, and the wires, that's the, that's the nerve cells, run over the surface of the retina getting in the way of the light and then finally they come to the blind spot where they dive through the retina because it's back to front and then they go back to the brain. Now, no designer would do that. It's a bonkers way to design things. But it is what you would expect as a result of historical accident. That's the way the eye just happened to arise originally hundreds of millions of years ago, probably thousands of millions of years ago. And as a consequence of that historical accident, that's the way it still is. Because even if it might make a certain amount of sense for natural selection to reverse the retina, think of the upheaval that that would involve in the embryological processes. Evolution, unlike a human designer, or presumably a god designer, cannot just go back to the drawing board, cannot throw away the existing design, toss it away, get a clean sheet of paper on the drawing board and start afresh. Evolution has to start with what it's got and modify what it's got so that we are rife with historical accidents. They're all over the body. That's one of the reasons why humans suffer so much back pain. Uh, because we are so recently risen from walking on all fours and we haven't yet properly accommodated to walking on our hind legs. We are walking museums of historical accidents. And of course we're also human, which makes it terribly tempting for us to think that somehow we are the end product of evolution and always intended to be the end product of evolution. Rather than ask you to speak on that, I've got a very brief reading there for you, <coughs> just, just a paragraph which I think tackles that issue very nicely. This is from the opening chapter of my book, The Ancestor's Tale. It's called The Conceit of Hindsight. It is a conceit of hindsight to see evolution as aimed towards some particular end point, such as ourselves. A historically minded swift, understandably proud of flight as self-evidently the premier accomplishment of life, might regard swift kind, those spectacular flying machines with their swept back wings who stay aloft for a year at a time and even copulate in free flight as the acme of evolutionary progress. If elephants could write history, they might portray tapirs, elephant shrews, elephant seals, and proboscis monkeys as tentative beginners along the main trunk road of evolution, taking the first fumbling steps, but each for some reason never quite making it, so near yet so far. Elephant, elephant astronomers might wonder whether on some other world there exist alien life forms that have crossed the nasal Rubicon and taken the final leap to full probositude. <laughs> Thank you. 
Bob Cormack mentioned uh, your book, The Selfish Gene, which I think was, was the book that launched you on the international scene and, and made you well known as a science writer. It's a book that's created a certain amount of confusion in people's minds, I think, just, just because of the title, um, as if you were advocating selfishness and justifying it on the basis of our genes. Would you like to just take a moment and explain what that book does argue? Yes, just I, I, wrote, I wrote The Selfish Gene in 1975, and at that time there was a spate of popular books by people like Robert Ardrey and Conrad Lawrence, uh, which advocated what's been called group selection, the idea that natural selection chooses between large groupings of animals, even species. And you can see the appeal of this because it means that you can easily account for animals being altruistic towards each other. If animals are selfish, then the group to which they belong might go extinct. And so group selection might um, favor individual altruism. Now that's not how natural selection works. I wanted to explain how natural selection works. And the right way to explain it, as I thought and still think, is the level of the selfish gene. Natural selection actually doesn't favor the differential survival of different groups. What it favors is the differential survival of genes. Those genes that are good at surviving are the ones that do survive, and all animals are built by genes that have been successful in programming the survival of their ancestors. And one way to put that is to say that not a single one of your ancestors ever died young. Lots and lots and lots of your ancestors' contemporaries died young, but not one single one of your ancestors died in childhood. Not a single one of your ancestors ever failed to copulate at least once. We all inherit the genetic legacy of successful ancestors. The genes of successful ancestors are inside us. The genes of unsuccessful ancestors are no longer here. Natural selection is the differential survival of genes, and we, that's to say we animals, because we're all animals, we are survival machines for our genes. That doesn't mean that we can't explain altruistic behavior in individual animals, including ourselves. And much of the point of my book, The Selfish Gene, was to explain altruistic behavior. We explain it by um, various methods, for example, altruism towards close kin, towards offspring, towards brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews, altruism towards individuals who are in a position to reciprocate, to pay back favors, and that can generalize to a more general kind of altruism. Now, Paula mentioned social Darwinism. Social Darwinism was a hideous misunderstanding, or I should say misapplication of Darwinism, uh, which was applied to humans in the 19th century, in the early parts of the 20th century, right up to Hitler. Um, Hitler, as you know, uh, was a fanatical eugenicist, and he actually tried to breed a superior race of human beings. Hitler was, in fact, putting into practice not really Darwinism at all. Hitler was putting into practice the selective breeding that had been known to agriculturalists and horticulturalists and dog breeders and flower breeders for centuries. If you want to breed a race of dogs that's good for retrieving, then you choose those dogs that are best at retrieving to breed from. If you want to breed horses that are good at running, you breed from the fastest horses. That was what Darwin used. That was the, that was the information that Darwin uh, took from animal and plant breeders. Darwin's huge insight was to take the techniques of stock breeders and say, well, nature could be doing the same thing. Just as a stock breeder breeds cattle for milk yield, breeds pigs for bacon yield, breeds greyhounds for running speed, so nature unconsciously, blindly, I call it the blind watchmaker, nature blindly takes on the role of the human stock breeder. That is Darwinism. Darwinism is the generalization of the stock breeding principle 
to nature. What Hitler took was nothing to do with Darwinism. What Hitler took was the stock breeding principle, which predated Darwin by, by centuries, and that's what the social Darwinists uh, took as well. Okay, thank you for that. We're going to move on to the God delusion now. Um, I think it's safe to say that it provoked a bit of a reaction, uh, got, a, got a bit of a response, largely a very <laughs> hostile response, it has to be said, uh, reading reviews of it in the press and some of the books that have been written in response to it. Um, I'd like to ask you in just a moment why, why you think the reaction was that hostile, but actually just to give you a bit of a clue, I've, I've given another reading for you there. If I can, can your voice hold up? I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go. All right. Right, this is an extraordinarily mild-mannered piece of, of uh, writing from The God Delusion. Um, <clears throat> the opening of chapter 2. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. What's to be hostile about that? Yes. Now, that, that actually, um, I intended that to be funny. Um, it, <laughs> It it's, is. It's something to do with the... the um, Paula, you're a connoisseur of English. Um, you will appreciate this. Um, I think it's something to do with the, the use of what are obviously very hostile words. Mm -hmm. But they're kind of long, Latinate. Mm -hmm. um, they're not sort of vulgar words. They're, they're sort of words that, you know, you know uh, misogynistic, um, megalomaniacal, filicidal. You just um, wanted to repeat them, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's... Um, I think that there is a sort of comedy there, and, and I, I must say that um, when my wife Lana and I do joint readings, which we quite often do for my books, we always like to begin with something to break the ice and get the audience laughing. And with The God Delusion, that, that was the bit that we chose uh, to, to get the audience laughing. However, Paul, you were asking what, why people take offence. The reason people take offence is that religion has had a free ride for centuries. People have simply got used to the idea that the one thing you cannot insult is somebody's religion. You can insult their taste in music, their taste in art, their taste in food, uh, their football team, what, anything you like, but you must not insult their religion. I think the time has come for that to stop. There's absolutely no reason why religion should be immune from criticism in exactly the same way as everything else is uh, susceptible to criticism. But it's a topic that people feel incredibly emotional about, isn't it? And, and, and do respond on a very emotional level when you do attack it. Um, do you not feel um, that that should be respected? I think that respect is something that people deserve, and I think that, that I would, I, I think I would follow, was it Mark Twain who said, um, or oh no, H.L. Mencken, I think, who mm -hmm. said, um, mm -hmm. I, I respect your religion to the same extent as I respect your belief that your wife is beautiful and your children smart. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're kind of running towards the end, the end of this part of the event, so I'd like to just give you a few minutes now to explain the main points that you put across in The God Delusion, <laughs> why you say there is almost certainly no God. When you want to believe in something, whether it's God or fairies or unicorns, the onus is on you to find a good reason to believe in it. Because there are a million things which one could postulate, like unicorns, like fairies, like celestial teapots in orbit around the sun, which you cannot disprove. And therefore, the first thing to say is that it's not good enough to say there is no absolute disproof of the existence of God. There has to be some kind of positive evidence for the existence of God. Now, throughout history, the positive evidence for the existence of God has always seemed to be the appearance of design in the world. 
and by far the most important inkling of design that people used to have was life. William Paley himself, uh, who wrote uh, Natural Theology, said that the living world is by far the most cogent piece of evidence for the existence of the Creator. He went on to discuss the celestial bodies, but he immediately said the celestial bodies are not a very strong piece of evidence. So life has always been the theist's trump card. And that particular trump card was blown up totally by Darwin and by his successors. So to the extent that people still try to see positive evidence for the existence of a creative deity, those who understand Darwinism, and I admit that many don't, but those who do understand it, have retreated away from the territory of biology. They've realized that there's no future in trying to defend God in biology. They've retreated to physics, to cosmology. What started the whole universe off? Where did it all begin? Why is there something rather than nothing? I'm not a physicist and I'm not so well qualified to talk about that as I am to talk about biological evolution. But it seems to me that one of the things I've gained from my studies of biology and study evolution in particular, I've had my consciousness raised as to the power of science to explain how you get complex things from simple things. That's what evolution does for you. Evolution starts from simplicity and works up to complexity. Now, if we're going to go back to the origin of the universe, nobody knows how it started, nobody knows what initiated the Big Bang, physicists are working on it. Maybe they will discover what it was and maybe they won't. But they've already got it down to the point where it's something very simple. If you suddenly smuggle in a creative intelligence at the origin of the universe, then what you have smuggled in is a complex entity, because an intelligence must be a complex entity, a complex entity of exactly the same kind of thing as we're trying to explain in the first place, as the end product of biological evolution. I think it's highly likely that in the universe there are complex intelligences so far advanced over ours that we would treat them as gods if we were ever to meet them. If we are ever visited by aliens from outer space, then we will bow our knee to them because they will be necessarily so far ahead of us in order to get here at all that they would seem like gods to us. But the important point is that they would not be gods in the sense that they just happened. They would have to have come about, come into existence as the end product of a long, gradual process of slow, cumulative, if not Darwinian evolution, then something equivalent. They had to have simple beginnings, because simple beginnings are easy to understand. Complex beginnings are not an explanation at all. Complexity is that which we're trying to explain in the first place. So I think that this, while this doesn't disprove the existence of any kind of God, it makes any kind of God of the creative kind, as opposed to the alien from outer space kind, any kind of God very, very, very improbable indeed. So you've got your arguments for, for why there almost certainly is no God. Of course, for a lot of people, religion is probably something, um, something of a comfort, um, something that gives them a sense of purpose in life and a sense of meaning in life, and something that actually helps to get them through. Why, why the campaign against it, Richard? Why, why be so hostile towards it? Is it not just something that's really a personal matter for people to, to pursue or not if they wish? I accept that some people get comfort from religion. And uh, I wouldn't wish to take away uh, the comfort of somebody, say, who's dying or who's bereaved 
something of that sort. Um, I would steadfastly resist, however, any suggestion that because it's comforting, therefore it's true. You'd be amazed how many people think that because something is consoling, it must be true. Or they, they might say, well, I mean, I just can't accept that when I die, I disappear. I mean, it would be intolerable if when I die, I disappear. Well, I'm afraid that something that's intolerable may just be true, just tough. Uh, you can't just magic something away because you wish it wasn't, it wasn't true. But you went on to ask why the campaign. Shouldn't be, people just be free to get on with their religion? Yes, they should, if they would leave the rest of us alone. Uh, and some of them, of course, do. <laughs> but when you think about, well, the most extreme examples, of course, are people who actually go to war for their religion. Uh, and it's, it wasn't over with the Crusades. I mean, we're, we're facing pro prospects of, at least threats of jihad to this day. Uh, and we have suicide bombers in the name of Allah, uh, and then within our own Christian society we have Christian bigoted busybodies interfering with scientific research, trying to stop stem cell research, um, trying to interfere at every new stage in scientific research where it interferes with their precious Bronze Age myths. They will try to stop it and with remarkably powerful political levers at their disposal the House of Lords contains bishops, as of right, who sit in the House of Lords simply because they are bishops. Royal commissions on reproductive ethics will always have clergymen, rabbis, mullahs, will automatically be invited onto these things, as though they had any kind of expertise to offer, rather than, say, serious moral philosophers or legal philosophers or scientists. We've got about five minutes left now, Richard. Um, so two last questions just to finish up with. The first one is, I'm quite in interested in, in the whole negative impression that people have of, of atheism and atheists. It seems that it's, it's kind of okay not to believe in God, but to be an atheist is just taking it that step too <coughs> far. Um, why, why do you think that is? How do you account for that? The American, and what can we do about it? Yes, the American comedian Julia Sweeney uh, an announced to the press at some point that she'd become an atheist, and she received a, a frantic telephone call from her mother. And her mother said, well, not believing in God I could understand, but an atheist? <laughs> we do have horns and a tail, don't we? Um, something about the way we're brought up. Uh, in, a, in the United States it is said that atheists are the most unpopular minority, according to opinion polls. An atheist is just somebody who doesn't believe in, well, probably doesn't believe in the God you believe in. Um, but you, if you are a theist, don't believe in Thor, and you don't believe in Apollo, and you don't believe in Zeus, and you don't believe in Mithras, etc., uh, etc. Et I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of gods that none of us believe in. And so, what is so special about going one god further? Um, I don't believe in any gods. I'm very prepared to believe in a god if anybody will produce any evidence. But for exactly the same reason, I'm assuming there are no Vikings here or Olympians here, and exact, for exactly the same reason as you don't believe in Thor with his hammer, because you can't disprove Thor with his hammer, but nobody's ever given you any good reason to believe in Thor and his hammer. You don't believe in him. Similarly, I've never been given any good reason to believe in Yahweh or Jehovah or whatever else one wishes to call the God of the Jews, Christians and Muslims. So, um, in, in all other respects, we atheists are decent, nice people, we're good people, some of us are bad people, some of us are good people, just as some Christians are bad, some Christians are good. Um, we are just like any other person, except we happen to, to, to feel about Yahweh the way everybody nowadays feels about Thor. Okay. <laughs>
And finally, Richard, you fairly recently set up a charitable foundation, haven't you? Can you just tell us a little bit about that and, and what its aims are? It's called the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, and it's two foundations, one in America and one in Britain. And the idea is to educate and do research into reason and science, the rational view of the world, and combating irrational views of the world, including all forms of superstition, and that includes religion. Um, the reason there are two charities is that the tax laws in, in America and Britain are rather different, and so it's convenient to have two linked charities with the same trustees and the same aims, so that um, it's easy to give money across the Atlantic either, either way. The most tangible um, the, um, result of the foundation so far has been the website that we run, which is richarddawkins.net. Uh, and um, I encourage anybody who wants to go look at that. It's a fairly lively forum. It's actually how I met Paula, because she's one of the um, most vigorous and, and eloquent uh, contributors to this to this website. Um, so do go and, go and look up richarddawkins.net. Well, I can endorse that recommendation. <laughs> That's it. Richard, thank you very much indeed for talking to me. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well, thank you very much indeed for that. Very interesting. And we're going to take your leave of us for a moment. So thank you very much indeed. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's very much over to you now for your questions. So, if you have questions, please make your way to the microphones. It's slightly hard to see. I need to move a little forward of the lights to see if there's anyone standing at the microphones. Do we have anyone at the moment? No one wants to come down at the moment? Well, feel free to do that and we will take your questions. I was just interested, Richard, in listening to you. Do you enjoy being controversial? Do you, are you actually... A, are you beating religious no, people? No, I, I don't enjoy being controversial. Um, I, I enjoy speaking out, speaking the truth, and uh, I, I think that one, one needs to call a spade a spade, but, uh, but no, I, d I don't particularly enjoy being controversial. Okay. We have a gentleman over here at the microphone already. So, sorry, your point, please. Uh, Mr. Dawkins, do you believe that animals or maybe insects will attain a level of consciousness such as we human beings enjoy? Uh, do I believe that animals are conscious, did you say? No, uh, will they ever attain a level of consciousness such as human beings have right now? Um, In the future, any time at all, well, will they ever achieve that? Uh, I suspect that some probably already have. I mean, I suspect that uh, chimpanzees and, um, and other apes and uh, advanced carnivores such as dogs, wolves, um, cats may be conscious. Um, in a rather different form from ours. Uh, excuse, uh, I mean, but, uh, to attain our level of uh, consciousness. Um. Well, I, I would rather doubt it, at least in the near future. Um, it's taken a very long time. Mammals have been going for a very long time, and our level of consciousness has only been very, very recently achieved. So. I don't think it's one of those things that you can predict is likely to happen in the way that, say, you can predict that uh, carnivores and herbivores are going to happen, or swimming animals are going to happen, or flying animals are going to happen. So if, say, there was another asteroid that destroyed life on this planet in the way that the dinosaurs were destroyed 65 million years ago, I think it was then predictable that something like the dinosaurs would arise again, which it did in the form of the mammals. But if an asteroid were to hit now and destroy us, I think it's not predictable that something like human consciousness would ever arise again. It might, but it's not predictable in the way that flight or sight or echolocation or swimming is predictable. But if we take evolution to its natural conclusion, surely everything evolves. So is the gentleman not right in what he says? No, there's no natural conclusion. Um, you have to look at the past history of evolution, and you have to say there is a general pattern of evolution towards running speed, swimming speed, flying speed. But it looks as though human consciousness has only happened once. And so this is, looks like a pretty unique state of affairs. Okay. Gentleman over here. Sir. 
Professor Dawkins, I can completely sympathise with you losing your voice. I've only just managed to find mine after a nasty cold. Could you talk a bit louder? <laughs> he says he's losing his voice. <laughs> oh, he's lost his voice. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I sympathise deeply. <laughs> yeah. uh, I wanted to ask, um, given the present state of uh, the global population's understanding and e uh, education and philosophy and science, how do you imagine our world would be if everybody embraced atheism? Um, how would the world be if everybody embraced atheism? What did that have to do with the, uh, the preamble to your question about a population? Well, to a degree you've uh, suggested that a number of people find a great deal of solace, perhaps even need, in religions. Um, are, we pre are we ready to abandon religion as a, as a, a global population, do you think? Well, um, I have some doubts about the solace that's offered by religion, I must say. I, I usually bend over backwards to concede that it might offer some solace. Uh, I uh, recognize that some people think that they would find life intolerable if they thought that there was no ultimate meaning to it. Um, if I were in better voice, I would have a go at persuading people that actually there is huge meaning to be had from a scientific view of life which revels in our understanding of its meaning and does not take false comfort in a hope, a vain hope, of some kind of eternal meaning. Um, then when people say they get solace from religion, I then wonder about those people who actually are terrified of going to hell. Now, I know that modern enlightened Christians no longer teach children about going to hell, but quite a lot of modern Christians are not enlightened, and children most certainly are taught about going to hell, and many of them, I'm extremely sorry to say, believe it. And so there are plenty of people who are terrified of dying. <coughs> I'm so sorry. <coughs> who are terrified of dying, uh, not because it's oblivion, because after all, what's frightening about oblivion? As Mark Twain said, I was dead for billions and billions of years before I was born, and never suffered the slightest inconvenience from it. <laughs> However, if you believe that you're going to suffer eternal, fiery torments, which many people have been persuaded by evil, preachers and teachers, I repeat evil, to believe, then it seems to me that that's likely to uh, give the very opposite of solace. If we had no religion, we would have, I suggest, if not no suicide bombers, far fewer suicide bombers. We would have, um, in very many ways, I think life would be indeed better. Uh, and but there would still be injustice in the world, surely? There would still be injustice in the world, but there's no reason to think there'd be more injustice in the world. And I think very arguably there might be less. Okay. So does that answer your point? Okay, thank you very much indeed. I just want to go to this lady over here. Thank Hi. you. It's fairly easy to imagine how apes can develop into humans, but I don't find it as easy to imagine how bacteria can develop into apes. Could you describe some of the species in between? Yes. Yeah. Um, the question says it's easy to imagine how apes could, uh, could, it could evolve into humans, but it's harder to imagine how bacteria could evolve into apes. Well, one very important difference is that the time it took for apes to change into humans is a matter of perhaps five million years, whereas the time it took for um, bacteria to evolve into apes was a matter of thousands of millions of years. So it is a huge difference. And what the human imagination is capable of visualizing um, gets more and more difficult the longer the time span is that you have to cope with. So the intermediates that you might expect to see would be, well, starting with bacteria, an early intermediate would be some kind of protozoan. That's to say, a single-celled animal, 
much more complicated than a bacterium because uh, it's a eukaryotic cell, which means that it's actually a kind of society of bacteria. The eukaryotic cell, which is all our cells, and protozoan cells, things like amoebas, are complex societies of bacteria. Bacteria actually came together in an agglomeration, working together to form this much larger, much more complex cell. A next stage in the intermediates would be a coming together of those cells, those eukaryotic cells, to form multicellular bodies, something like a sponge. A next stage would be perhaps something like a sea anemone, which has um, an inside and an outside and has a feeding mechanism. The next stage would be something like a worm, which has a front and a back and a left side and a right side and which propels itself along the sea bottom. The next stage might be something like a fish, which, well, we know what a fish looks like. Um, then, um, much later still, some fish started emerging from the water and we have extremely good fossil evidence of this stage in evolution when fish emerged from the water and became amphibians. <clears throat> At a later stage still, um, these amphibians no longer needed to go back to water to reproduce and became reptiles. At a later stage still, they, be they became mammal-like reptiles. They were, instead of going along with their feet splayed out sideways like a lizard, they rose with their limbs more vertical and they may have grown hair at this stage, we don't know whether they grew hair at this stage, um, and walked on all fours, and there was a magnificent flowering of mammal-like reptiles, actually before the dinosaurs. During the period of the dinosaurs, um, the mammals went rather into eclipse. When the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, the mammals started to flourish and flower and produce the magnificent range of mammals that we see today, among whom were some rather shrew-like ones who went into the trees and became adept at swinging through the trees. Some of them became adept at swinging from their arms rather than their legs. It's called brachiation. And they lost their tails. They became the apes. Um, and that's where you wanted me to stop. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Explain to me why we still have apes, then. Why haven't they all evolved? Why on earth should we all have evolved? Apes are doing a very nice job as apes. Actually, they're not doing too well. Um, but in principle, the general question is, why would you ex why if, if, I mean, you're, you're hung up on the idea that humans are the end product of evolution. No, I'm just curious as to why, if apes, if humans evolved into apes, sorry, if, if apes evolved into humans, why didn't they all evolve? Why do we still have, have apes? We never evolved from chimpanzees, we never evolved from orangutans, we never evolved from gorillas. Gorillas and chimpanzees and orangutans evolved from a common ancestor which they share with us. So a chimpanzee might just as well say, oh, if chimpanzees evolved from humans, why are they still humans? Gentleman over here. <coughs> I was wondering if you could give us a succinct definition of what you mean by life. Succinct, my dear. Yes. Succinct. <laughs> it's not always necessary to give a succinct definition of what you mean by something because sometimes things gradually merge into other things. Um, if you consider the distinction between a child and an adult, for legal purposes, we are obliged to make a succinct distinction between a child and an adult. It happens on the stroke of midnight of the 18th birthday. But everybody knows that there's no real distinction between the child before midnight and after midnight. Similarly, when life began, there may not have been a single moment when you could say, before that we didn't have life, after that we did have life. If I were forced to define that moment, it would be the moment when heredity first came into the world, the moment when the first self-replicating molecule, which is the prerequisite that you need in order for 
evolution by natural selection to get going. So I suppose my definition of life would be that which evolves by Darwinian natural selection. And that means that it started when the first gene came into the world. And when was that? Between 3.5 billion and 4 billion years ago. Is that the your definition? <laughs> well, uh, it's uh, yeah. what uh, Professor Dawkins has to offer as a definition. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <coughs> I just want to double check that there aren't people standing up still. There are, yes, uh, sorry, it's just I couldn't actually see you up there. Let's just uh, go right to the very top then. Yes, gentleman in the white shirt. Professor Dawkins, um, with the population of the Earth already reaching 6 billion, and the increase in medical sciences curing diseases and the increase in IVF and with many scientists believing the population can't increase anymore what's your opinion on that? Are we heading down a wrong path with that increase? I think it's extremely worrying that, that our population is growing so fast um, it is already as you say 6 billion and uh, it, that, that is very worrying um, I think you can't just suddenly stop because that would produce a, a very weird age distribution. Uh, but I, I do think that um, population growth is something we, we do have to face up to. Uh, it is one of the most worrying things. I agree with the questioner. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank in you. the middle here, gentleman here. Yes, Professor Dawkins. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned in your God delusion that, um, yeah, you mentioned in your book about how some religions um, are bigoted towards certain races or sexualities. You know, for example, the Westboro Baptist Church. Do you believe that these people actually believe God is telling them to do this, or do you think that they are just using God as a cover for their actions? Uh, the, the Westboro Baptist Church is, is, a, is a bunch of... Um, really very, very weird and unpleasant people and I, I would hate to blame um, the Christian religion for these extreme wingnuts. Um, so the, the questioner is asking whether they really believe that, that God is telling them to, to do that. I, I couldn't say. I mean, uh, the, the, the Westboro Baptist Church is ruled by a patriarch who is, is clearly an extremely unpleasant man. Um, does he believe it? I actually think he probably does believe that God's telling him to, to do what, what he's doing, but I, I should hate to blame God for him. I'm not sure if there's anybody over here. Do we have anybody with the microphones here? No? <laughs> not at the moment. Okay. Let's just go to this gentleman down here then. Mr. Dawkins, welcome to the Bible Belt. Um, I've been wondering about the interaction between atheistic approaches to science and theistic approaches to science. And what I wonder about is, is the connection between your atheism and your science, and similarly how you view theistic science, scientists. And um, we've got um, Dr. John Lennox coming up here, for example, in a few months' time. Um, do you think he's a, a, a worse scientist because he's a theist? Um, and how do you, how, well, just generally, how do you view the interaction between theism and science, and do you think it's inferior? The, um, the, the, the orthodox position among my fellow scientists is that science and religion have no connection with each other and they are completely separate from each other and so you can be a perfectly good scientist whether or not you're an atheist or a theist it makes absolutely no difference and um, your beliefs about religion are private beliefs that do not interfere or interact in any way with your science and I think this must be true for the many excellent scientists who are religious. I would qualify that in two ways. First, when you hear of a scientist who says he's religious or she's religious, you want to ask very carefully what religion they believe in. Um, it could be what I call Einsteinian religion, which means that they may be fond of using the word religion, they may be fond of using the word God, but they don't actually believe in a supernatural creative intelligence. Einstein certainly did not. Einstein used the word God as a sort of um, colorful way of expressing his reverence for the mysteries of the universe. So in the sense that Einstein was religious, so am I. And I think you'll find that a lot of scientists who call themselves religious 
will on further inspection turn out to be religious only in the Einsteinian sense. Um, I take the liberty of saying the same thing about my colleague from my last night's um, croaked out encounter in Edinburgh, the former Bishop of Edinburgh, Richard Holloway, who is clearly a very, very saintly man, a very, very intelligent man, um, calls himself a Christian, but actually is an agnostic, um, and, uh, and ag agrees that he's an agnostic. So I think many of the scientists that claim to be religious will, will turn out to be religious only in the sense of Einstein or Bishop Holloway. There are others, however, who really are religious in the full Christian or Jewish or Muslim sense. Is that incompatible with their science? Well, um, on the face of it, no, because some of, them are, some of them are very good scientists. I find it hard to see the compatibility. I find it hard to see how they can reconcile it. And in some cases, I think they do it by compartmentalizing their mind into different compartments that don't, they don't allow one to enter the other. And that may be true of John Lennox, whom you're expecting a visit from later. Okay. You happy with that? Sorry, yeah. The gentleman over here in the green. Question about, it's the question about the meaning of life, really. Um, coming back to that, um, like, like d does science g give the answer, I think is the question, really. And, like, a scientist, Nobel Prize winning scientist like Peter Meadow would say that the question, why, why are we here, can't be answered by science. And I, I don't understand how we can say with such confidence that it can. Well, what I would say about the question why is why do you think you have any right to ask it? Uh, it's not a meaningful question except unless you um, specify the kind of answer you're, you're, you're expecting. As a biologist, it's very easy to answer the question, why do birds have wings, for example? I mean, we can do that in, Dar in Darwinian terms. If you say, however, um, why do mountains exist? There are some questions which simply don't deserve an answer. I mean, the question, um, why do mountains exist? You can give an answer in terms of the geological um, processes that give rise to, to, to mountains, but that's not what you want, is it? You want something about the purpose of mountains. What is the purpose of a mountain? It's a silly question. It doesn't deserve an answer. The mere fact that you can ask a question, the mere fact that you can frame a question in the English language doesn't mean that it's entitled to an answer. If I say to you, what is the, what is the color of jealousy? It's a perfectly grammatical English sentence, but it's not a question that deserves an answer. The correct answer is, don't ask such a silly question. But is it not part of the human condition to ask these it questions? It may well be part of the human condition to ask silly questions, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe that's why people turn to religion, is to find that answer. <laughs> Gentlemen, there. <laughs> Actually, would you mind just waiting one second? Sorry, it's just that these people up here have been waiting for some time, so I'll just go to in the middle here and I'll come back to you just for one second. In the middle there. Professor Dawkins. Thanks very much for what you're doing. I know that uh, at least a few friends who might have been uh, had their lives changed by the books you've written. It's, it's easy for us sometimes in an increasingly secular Britain to feel smug when we see the levels of belief there still are in the United States of America. Yet it also seems that the levels of rationality are not uh, increasing in Britain. Um, a colleague of mine claims to be an, an atheist, uh, will not believe anything unless there's good evidence. In fact, she claims to be a typical Sagittarian in that respect. <laughs> As a teacher, uh, I'd appreciate your, uh, your ideas as to how we can go about promoting rational thinking. Thank you, yes, a very interesting question. Um, the passage about crystals that I read was preceded by uh, a bit about people who believe in crystal healing. You know, you, sort of, you place crystals at the 
four corners of your bath while you're having a bath and, and somehow healing energy seeped out from the crystals and things. So religion is not the only form of irrational superstition. There's plenty of others. And when people give up religion, they don't often resort to rationality. They often resort to um, other kinds of superstitious nonsense. So, what do we do about it? I think teach critical ways of thought. So when we teach science, obviously we need to teach what we know about science, and that's exciting and interesting. But teach, in particular, the scientific way of thinking, the skeptical way of asking questions. What is the evidence for your belief? If you believe that so-and-so is true, why do you believe it? What's the evidence for it? Is this the kind of belief that we have acquired through evidence, or is it the kind of belief that people just made up, or the kind of belief that is just handed down by tradition from generation to generation? Is it the kind of belief that people simply feel inside themselves, in which case it's worthless? Is it the kind of belief that uh, people have just, be, just read in some book? If the book itself was not written on the basis of evidence, then again, it's, it's worthless. I don't think it's that difficult to teach critical thinking. You're not indoctrinating, you're not teaching a lot of facts. You're teaching children how to think for themselves, how to ask questions, how to react skeptically to statements of belief from other people. It's, it's obviously hard for a young child to do that, but even a young child, I think, could be taught to ask the right kind of question. What is the evidence for this? You're a teacher, you probably know more about this than I do, have more experience about, of, of this than I do. I certainly uh, do try to promote critical thinking skills, but um, as, as you say, I do feel that isn't indoctrination, but sometimes even that is considered to be indoctrination by colleagues. Obviously we want to stay away from indoctrination as far as possible. It's always very hard to draw the distinction, but I think teaching children to think critically is about as far from indoctrination as you can get. Okay, let's go to this gentleman over here. Been waiting a while. Yeah, I'd just like to ask uh, Richard's position on the, the Large Hadron Collider that's coming on this 2008, this summer, and how that's going to be a fun little change, almost like Darwin's Beagle when he went to Galapagos. Will that actually hammer one of the final nails in the proverbial coffin of conventional religion as we find that unified physics model of basically the Higgins-Poisson particle and, and basically every particle that this universe is made out of? I think when we do find this, and I think that we will do find, we will, we will do find this, will actually cement another kind of layer on religion is irrelevant to us in the way that, that science can offer us more, much more answers than religion, in the way that science can answer the questions that it seemingly is unanswerable by religion, in a way that you have to make that leap of faith to kind of circumvent that these these kind of dangerous questions that don't really have an answer, but science is providing an answer, it's much more theoretically possible okay. than... Let's, let's get an answer to um, some of that if we can. <laughs> I know it's, it's a bit of a well, I'm, I'm question, not but I just, wanted to, I just wanted to find out your position yeah. on it. Well, let's, let's get his answer. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I had That's okay, uh, let's, let's just uh, get his answer. I, I, I'm not a physicist. I, I, I visited CERN, the, the establishment near Geneva that you must be referring to. Um, it is a most moving experience. Uh, it's, I think, a 26-mile, is it radius or diameter, um, circular um, acceleration um, tunnel. And it's vast, it's huge. And when you go down there, you go it's deep underground, and um, it's an international operation. It's one of the most moving experiences I think I've ever had uh, to have this in international team of people cooperating together, working together to batter down the very frontiers of understanding. It looks to me as though theoretical physics has been stuck at an impasse for uh, quite a number of years now, waiting for experimental physics to catch up. And experimental physics just might provide 
gigantic breakthroughs, as the question suggests, this year, next year, really very soon. Um, as to what effect that might have on people's religious beliefs, who knows? Uh, for somebody of my bias, it would, it would um, provide yet more evidence of our deep understanding of the universe, but at the same time, evidence of how much deeper we've got to go. Because every new breakthrough that modern physics achieves seems to uncover new vistas of mystery which were not dreamed of before. And if you look at the history of 20th century physics through um, special relativity, general relativity, and the various advances in, in quantum mechanics, each one seems more amazing than the one before. And it doesn't look as though that's going to stop. Some physicists think it is going to stop. So I have an almost religious feeling about this, that, 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 the, that the mysteries of the universe are tantalizing, intriguing, and wonderful. Um, others may respond in a more directly religious way and say this only um, lays bare the glory of God even even further. So I think it may be that there will be no um, obvious tendency for the advances that CERN achieves to um, go either for or against conventional religion. I naturally hope that it will go against. Do you have any fears about it? There are some people expressing fears about what they're going to do in that tunnel in Switzerland in terms of well, the um, impact that recreating the Big Bang might have. Yes, I, 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 I think there's a probably un unrealistic. I mean, there, there are some people who feel that, you know, when will it all end and, and, and maybe the whole world will, will blow up or something. Um, physicists that I've talked to say that's extremely unlikely. I hope they're right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, forgive me, sir, if I don't come back to you. I just want to, to move over here to this lady. Professor Dawkins, uh, when you spoke about the Selfish Gene book, you mentioned that we're effectively a collection of genes whose ancestors have survived for generations. While fully taking into account the previous questioner about the, the rapid growth in human population, in the affluent Western world particularly, more and more people are choosing not to have children. Does that mean that there's some kind of arms race going on between our evolved intelligence and the genes. On the one hand, the genes wanting to recreate, and on the other hand, free human choice to not have children. It's a very fascinating idea, isn't it, that, um, that the natural selection of the selfish genes has created our brains as a, as a tool for their own survival. And when it, when, when it was first created by natural selection, in the Pleistocene era on the plains of Africa, it was a tool for making us good at gathering and hunting. But now, um, the brain has, in a sense, overreached itself from the point of view of the selfish genes, so that the brain has discovered, for example, contraception, which is a very anti-selfish gene thing to do. Uh, the brain has discovered um, art and music and all sorts of pleasures which distract us from the real business of getting down to it and making babies. Um, I rather subscribe to my friend and colleague Steven Pinker, who's an, who uh, believes strongly in the view of the selfish gene, but he says, I, Steven Pinker, have no intention of having children, and if my genes don't like it, my genes can go jump in the lake. <laughs> So there is a sort of rebellion on our hands. The brains, the big brain which was manufactured by the selfish genes for the propagation of selfish genes has now rebelled and has devoted itself to all sorts of other pleasures and amusements uh, which have nothing to do with propagating selfish genes. Uh, and I, for one, am very happy about that, but I think it's a very intriguing point you've, you've, you've raised, that there is this kind of tension between the original, quote, purpose for which we were put into the world and the, and the, the, the private purposes which we all dream up inside ourselves. Finish the next book, write the next symphony, um, 
uh, win the next football match, whatever, whatever it is, which are making use of goal-seeking activities which were put into our brains by the selfish genes for a very different purpose. Okay, you have with that. I want to go up here now because the gentleman's been waiting there for a while, I think. Hi, Professor Hawkins. All right. um, Sorry, actually, would you wait for just one second? Sorry, I wanted to go to the person in the middle row. Is there someone there waiting? Yes? Or not? No, uh, my question, my All right, question sorry. was uh, more relevant to the last day. Uh, <coughs> the last question. <coughs> Fairly well okay, all right, that's fine. If you're happy, then that's good. We'll move on. So, this lady up the top. Yeah. Thank you. I would like to ask you a question about reproduction. Uh, if two people, they do want to have a children and um, uh, a child, and uh, it's a male who is 25 year old, and also the female is the same. Um, I think both of the sperm cell and the egg cell would be at that age. So why is the new cell they made together and um, becomes zero year, like becomes zero? Is it because that the gene is what they passed on from generation to generation? And I was wondering also, is gene, does gene has a, have an age? I'm sorry, I didn't quite... The so genes have an age in effect. The point is, if two 25-year-olds have a child, the child starts at year zero, I think, is the point that she's making. I think if, if you think of Dolly the Sheep, for instance, when they cloned Dolly the Sheep, oh, they, oh, oh, the gene there actually was quite an old gene, it turned out. Dolly was born, was she not, at the same age as the, the mother where they'd taken the gene from? Um, that, if, if that's the question, I mean, there, there was certainly a, a suggestion that, that, that because Dolly, uh, when she was a lamb, was cloned from a cell of an adult sheep, that Dolly's cells might have the same age as the adult sheep from which um, she was cloned. I don't think that would be in the same way true if, um, say, a 75-year-old man um, had a child in the ordinary way. What's much more likely is that the sperm would be a, a rather less viable sperm but I don't think it would be right to say that the child would, would start life, so to speak, with an, with an advanced age. That, that wouldn't be the, the, the right way to put it. Okay. Let's move over here. Gentleman here. Um, hi. I'd just like to ask Richard um, what your opinion in, on, say, philosophy has had, maybe, on any of your work. Um, I do tend to think sometimes that you are kind of maybe sometimes revising Nietzsche in the fact that God is dead, and maybe now can we just have the evidence to provide and say that, well, God is dead, we have no more need for him. I've never really understood this God is dead uh, quote from, from Nietzsche. Um, why say God is dead rather than that God never existed in the first place? Yes, um, I understand that say God is dead in the fact that we, we have not killed God literally, but that God is dead that we have no longer the use and we no longer need the idea of God anymore in our lives, and we can finally disband that because we no longer need that to survive. Yes, I mean, um, I, I'm, I'm inclined to ag ag agree with that, but what, what, so what's the question? The question was just how much maybe any philosophy had had uh, in, in your work, any impact any philosophers had had within your work. And in, in, any what, sorry? Any philosophers, philosophers have had. Oh. Have they influenced you in any way? Oh, oh, oh sorry, okay. Um, any philosophers? Um, I'm not desperately well read in philosophy, I have to confess. I'm a, I'm a scientist and um, the philosophers that I've read have not been um, very, very many. I, I probably should, should uh, confess to that. Um, so I probably can't really answer your question very well. Okay, thank you. Right. Okay. Gentlemen over here now. Professor Dawkins, uh, two points on the God delusion and points that you had uh, raised this evening as well. First is one just to commend you on this idea of critical eva evaluation, uh, and particularly amongst children. Uh, I myself am a Christian youth worker, and if I've gained something from your book, it is the avoidance of indoctrination. And in the practice that I, I actually go with now, is to ask children to think for themselves, it's to be very careful about that to present scripture to them and ask them to make their own judgments about it. So that is something I've gained from your book that I thank you for. The other is a sticking point I have though with, with one of the central things as you describe it in your book. Um, 
I am of the contention that, that something began the universe, that much I'm persuaded by. Uh, you talk a, If I've understood you correctly, I apologise if I haven't, um, if I've understood you, it's necessary that what began the universe is something simple. Uh, and indeed, the physics seems to be homing in on that. What I just can't quite get a grasp of logically is why necessarily the thing that began the universe has to be simple. Why can it not be an incalculably complicated entity which began the universe that is outside of the universe? Okay, thank you. Um, something that is complicated is, to me, by definition, statistically improbable. If you look at the main arguments that are used by creationists against evolutionists, they are nearly always of the form, look at an eye, look at a haemoglobin molecule, look at a heart. It is immensely complicated. The probability that if you got the bits of an eye and shook them up together at random, you would get something that could see is vanishingly small. If you took the bits of a haemoglobin molecule and shuffled them at random, the probability is all but zero. And some of them even work out the odds against, you know, 10 to the whatever it is, um, odds against. So everybody seems to accept, and I do as well, the argument that says that statistically improbable things don't just happen or they have a very, 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 very low probability of happening. A perfect hand at bridge. We know how often it happens, but it's very, 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 very rare. So anybody who postulates a theory which is equivalent to dealing themselves a perfect hand at bridge has got a very bad theory. The creationist argument against evolution is always of this form. They always think that evolution is a theory of chance and therefore they think that they have um, disproved evolution by pointing out that to get something like an eye or a haemoglobin molecule is about as equivalent, about as improbable as getting a perfect hand at bridge. I accept that criticism if evolution were a theory of chance. Evolution is not a theory of chance, it's a theory of non-random survival. Evolution by natural selection is the only theory we know of that is capable of generating improbability equivalent to an eye or a haemoglobin molecule by sensible mechanisms rather than by the sheer luck of getting a perfect hand at bridge. Now a god who is capable of designing the universe a God who is moreover capable of listening to your prayers, forgiving your sins, raising you from the dead, redeeming your sins. Such a God, it, over and above creating the universe, over and above inventing the Big Bang, over and above setting the fundamental constants and laws of physics, would have to be the most stupendously perfect hand of bridge. And that is, it seems to me, to be a perfectly straightforward argument using the standard creationist argument which they wrongly use against evolution but using it correctly to turn it back on them against God himself. I'm sorry to come back, I promise I'll leave Just you very briefly, after this. Um, uh, all I would say in response to that is that seems a very good argument against uh, a creationist. If I say to you that, yes, I'm very comfortable with evolution as you have described it, and I see that as a, as a workable pattern, um, the argument about things coming about by chance and the improbability of that surely then doesn't apply to the God who would begin that as well. Well, okay, if, if the God that you wish to postulate is an exceedingly simple entity, some kind of quantum fluctuation, then we have no, no disagreement because clearly that's the kind of theory that we're looking for, that's the kind of theory that physicists are looking for. But then you cannot make that God do duty to forgive your sins, listen to your prayers and things like that. You cannot have it both ways. Either the God you're talking about is a simple quantum fluctuation, in which case I agree with you, we're simply arguing about words, I, I wouldn't use the word God. 
But if you're trying from that to smuggle in a God who, who listens to prayers and forgives sins, then, then you cannot have it both ways. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Now we've only got about 15 minutes left, ladies and gentlemen, so I would ask if you're queuing to ask a question, if you could keep it relatively brief. And I'm going to ask Professor Dawkins to do, this, Dawkins to do the same. I know it's not easy, but gentlemen here. Professor Dawkins, a, the subject of evidence obviously includes all the evidence and not just part of the evidence. And so I read your book with interest to see uh, what you had to say with regard to the Christian God and you confessed that you were going to dismiss the Bible at a very early stage. What interested me was that you never addressed the central two arguments that the Bible uses for the existence of God. Uh, the primary argument which the scripture uses with regard to the existence of God is Maybe I'll preface, I'll preface it for the benefit of yourself and the scientists around. Newtonian physics can predict the future. It can tell us about billiard balls going here and there and everywhere. And wherefore we got a mechanical view of the universe. But we all know, know uh, that quantum physics tells us it's very different from that. And we cannot actually predict things at the uh, sub-molecular level. Therefore we're talking about the difficulty of prediction. We can predict things pretty well, but not everything. That's the central argument that the Bible uses for the existence of God. And he brings forth this very concept, and contrary to all the other gods, that he predicts the future. And that is, the, the, you probably recognize this argument in another form, that is the prediction of prophecies, prophecies being made many hundreds of years before being fulfilled. That is set forth as one of okay. the major. Could you comment on that? I must say I'm rather astonished that anybody could seriously offer biblical prophecy as no, evidence excuse, for anything. Excuse me, that's not the argument. The, the argument is predicting the future is something we cannot do. God says it's a prerogative that he can do. He has demonstrated this. Well, where has he demonstrated it? Well, that can be demonstrated by, by people who are familiar with scripture, that it's not very difficult. Well, go ahead. Right, I'll do that, if you'll, if you'll forgive me. Right? This is very, these are very familiar arguments to most Christians, and that's why I'm saying very, quite surprising you don't deal well, with Well, they them. may be familiar to most Christians, but they're, they're pretty well rubbished by biblical scholars who've, who've actually studied the texts. Well, for, for example, the alleged um, fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies in the New Testament are all due to the fact that the writers of the New Testament knew the Old Testament prophecies very well and wrote the New Testament in order that they should look as though they'd been fulfilled. We're familiar with that argument, but yet you put a challenge forward. <laughs> the, the argument is very, very familiar to many, many Christians who can see. Can I, you've put a challenge forward. Let me try to be, let me try to do it briefly. You're, you're, familiar, you're conscious it's a bigger argument, but we'll need to do, try to be brief for yourself. Well, we do need to be brief, sir, certainly, yes. We, we, we can, from, scholars can tell us the text of the Old Testament was written before the Septuagint was translated, as you know, 300 years BC. Therefore, the prophecies in the Old Testament we know were written before that date. I mean, that is a, a, an undisputed fact. They were written before. Your question was, you know, that the New Testament text has been doctored to fit in with these prophecies. We don't need New Testament texts to prove the Old Testament prophecies being true. The early disciples never used a New Testament text. They used the Old Testament. They used the Testament that we've got in front of us, and we can use it. But right what now. are the prophecies? Right, I'll give you some examples. Just, just very briefly. Oh, one, 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 oh, maybe one. One, <laughs> right. Daniel 9, verse, Daniel chapter 9 tells us that when the Messiah was going to come, he would be he would be killed before the destruction of the temple. This one factor, when many, Christ when many Jews actually address these factors, they say, well, you mean the Messiah was killed before the temple was destroyed? We know when the temple was destroyed. 
There is our prophecy, but one prophecy is maybe not enough. Well, I'm afraid it's all we're going to have to, we're going to, have to settle for that. We'll just get a response from Professor Dawkins. But to be, to be fair, the point is that... Well, well no, sorry, sir, I'm going to just ask for a response. It's just we do have quite a few people waiting and time is against us, so if you wouldn't mind. Sorry. When people allege that prophecies have been fulfilled, or indeed any kind of allegedly uncanny coincidence, they're usually a lot more uncanny than that particular one from Daniel, which could have meant absolutely anything as far as I can see. But even if Daniel had prophesied something really, really impressive, then one would still say it doesn't have to be that impressive because there are so many prophecies, which, or so many verses which could be taken to be prophecies and which don't come true. You only notice the ones that do. This particular one seemed to me to be about as unimpressive as one could imagine. But... Um, but the, um, the reason it was mentioned was because there's that. evidence about the dating of the prophecy. Now, we've got evidence with regard to its fulfillment, and that can be said about many prophecies. Well, sir, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just draw a veil over that one for the moment. I'm sorry, but it's just I do want to move on. Thank, you. thank you very much indeed for that. Thank you, Phil. over here. I hear a lot of people using the phrase, when the universe began, and I don't understand what it was like before the universe began. Was there a complete vacuum? Was it born out of nothing? I don't understand what it was like before the universe began. Physicists will tell you, if you ask them that question, physicists will say that's an illegitimate question. I don't really understand why it's an illegitimate question. They say that the word before doesn't have any meaning before the Big Bang, because time itself began at the Big Bang. Therefore, there is no meaning to be attached to the word before. My puny little human brain isn't capable of grasping that, and there are some physicists who will say that in any case you don't need to grasp it because that is only true of the local universe in which we live, and they, force, they um, see, they visualize what they call a multiverse in which there are lots and lots of universes, each one occupying its own bubble, we are in just one bubble, which was bubbled off from some other universe beforehand. So that's one way in which physicists can reconcile the problem of before the Big Bang. But that's a hypothesis, isn't it? That's not evidence, and your whole argument is about evidence. Of course it's not evidence. Um, it's it's um, one of the things that physicists are grappling with at the very frontier of what's possible for the human mind to grapple with. Um, it's possible that there are physicists here who can clarify it in a way that I can't because I'm a mere biologist. But I think this is one of the examples of an extremely exciting thing that physical science is, cosmological science, is indeed uh, grappling with at the moment. You'll forgive me if there are physicists here. Please keep in, stay in your seats. <laughs> we don't have time for that explanation. Gentlemen over here. Good afternoon, Dr. Dawkins. Um, something that you touch upon in your book, The God Delusion, um, that I share a, a great concern with is um, the factor of child abuse, that religion can be considered um, abusive towards children, particularly in its more extreme cases. Do you think there is much hope that as a civilization, as a society, whatever you want to call it, do you think we have much hope of being able to criticize religion to the extent where we can actually really do something about the abuse that does happen? For example, in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, there are cases of children being stoned to death and burned at the stake because they're witches and so on and so forth. A lot of these things happen and not in the name of religion, surely. That's perhaps true. Do we have to differentiate between religion and the individual? Yes, we do, but these things are done specifically in the name of religion. That's the difference. Okay. That's the yes, um, I, I mean, it, it, it is very worrying. When children themselves are brought up to believe that faith is a virtue, to believe that you don't have to justify what you believe in, ter in terms of evidence, when you're told that uh, our tradition is that we do so and so, and you're discouraged from ever questioning it, it's extremely hard to break out of that loop. I would recommend reading Ayan Hersey Ali, uh, this wonderful woman from 
Somalia, who was brought up a Muslim, was actually genitally mutilated in her girlhood uh, and escaped from Islam and is now an atheist living in, in, in America. Um, she's an example to everybody what can be done by an intelligent person to break away from the indoctrination that uh, many children, probably most children around the world, are inflicted with. Um, it's, I don't really, I think the problem is a, is a political one. I, I don't have a political so solution. Do you think there are any more people of faith who are bad, if I can put it that way, as opposed to people without faith who are bad? I think there are people who are bad, um, who both with and, and without faith. If I could quote Steven Weinberg, the famous um, Nobel Prize winning physicist, he said, good people do good things and bad people do bad things, but for good people to do bad things, that takes religion. Can we go to this gentleman up here? Gentleman at the very top up here. Hi. Um, Professor, given the sort of overwhelming weight of evidence that human society is impoverishing the earth in terms of climate change, resource depletion, species extinction, is there, is there something in our makeup that compels us to act like this? Or is there some evidence that we're able to evolve and take on board this evidence and change the way that we're acting as individuals and as a, a society? The, the, yes, this is a profoundly disturbing uh, question. Um, evolution by natural selection has no foresight. Evolution by natural selection can only favor short-term advantage, short-term survival. So if a species is behaving in a way that a, a godlike being looking down from above can see is hell-bent on destruction. There is nothing that evolution by natural selection can do to save it. Foresight came into the world probably for the first time in advanced brains, especially human brains. Humans may be unique in the entire animal kingdom in being able to look into the future, the distant future, and say, if we carry on doing what we're doing in a, in a hundred years, in two hundred years, in five hundred years, we shall be extinct. No animal in the history of evolution has ever had the power to do that. If they were behaving in a way that was, as a matter of fact, driving the species extinct, there was nothing to stop it happening as long as individual advantage favored the destructive behavior, favored it at the level of competition between individuals within the species, then individual competition would go on driving the species to extinction until the moment when extinction occurred. There was never a mechanism which said the species that took steps to stop itself going extinct are the species that survive. If only natural selection worked at the species level, if only natural selection could favor those species whose individuals behave in such a way as to halt self-destructive behavior in time to stop species extinction, then natural selection would have stopped species going extinct. But more than 99% of the species that have ever lived have, as a matter of fact, gone extinct. Okay. Humans are the only species we know that has the gift of foresight, the gift of prophecy in the real sense, not the, not the mystical mumbo-jumbo sense, but the real sense of, of looking at the evidence and looking into the future and using the evidence to predict the future. This we can do, and if we had the political will to take note of our ability to look into the future, we could indeed do what no other animal has ever done before and halt the headlong rush to extinction. 
Okay, we've got three people still waiting to speak. We'll just uh, maybe hear your two questions together and we'll get Professor to answer those. Thank you, I'll keep it brief. Uh, Emile Durkheim suggested that religion has a social function and Roger Scruton, modern day philosopher, has voiced his concern about the, with the death of religion, this has not been replaced. Can you possibly envision a secular church to replace the uh, weekly Sunday and yes. uh, just a passing comment, uh, answer to Nietzsche, God is not dead, he's just planning a less ambitious project. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether there really is a need. Um, some people have said that people need uh, to, to go to, if not to church, to go to some kind of an institution uh, once a week or whatever it is, to uh, get a feeling of fellowship, a feeling of bonding, uh, a feeling of togetherness, a feeling of belongingness. Um, if that were the case, then presumably it shouldn't be beyond the wit of woman and man to put together some kind of, of substitute. Um, I don't know about you, I don't feel any particular need to go somewhere and bond once a week. Um, but uh, if I did, I'm sure I would find, uh, go to a concert. You don't watch football then? <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> Evidently mean, not. Maybe, Sorry. maybe football is it, I don't know. But, but um, I, I don't think it's obvious that we, that we need any alternative. Um, maybe we need an alternative to, um, to uh, help us to understand the universe. And of course science does that far better than religion ever could. Okay, gentlemen there, and then we'll come over here. Oh, are you, you're, you're, you're happy, okay. I would like to ask you, Professor, what do you have to say to someone, to someone who has met the risen and living Lord Jesus Christ, who has walked with God for over 50 years, <coughs> who received anointing of the Holy, the Holy Spirit, with the same consequences as the early apostles in the book of Acts. Sir, what do you have to say? Because I assure you for my life, it has been no delusion. If you had been born in India, I dare say you would be saying the same thing about Lord Krishna and Lord Shiva. If you had been born in Afghanistan, I dare say you would be saying the same thing about Allah. If you had been born in Viking Norway, you would be saying the same thing about Wotan. If you had been born in Olympian Greece, you'd be saying the same thing about uh, Zeus and Apollo. The human mind is extremely susceptible to hallucination. Well, you come back on that, sir. Sir, I'm being allowed by the friend I used to work with to come back. I cannot afford to build my life on hallucination, but on Jesus Christ who is the rock. And it is that I have asked you to address, please. You are obviously sincere, uh, but obviously I do not share your beliefs and I think you are hallucinating. That's all I can say. I don't doubt your sincerity. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. And as you thank Professor Dawkins, welcome back. Bob Cormack from UHI. Let me now just uh, briefly bring this uh, event to a close and on your behalf may I thank Professor Dawkins for coming north to Inverness and to UHI to engage in a dialogue with his views and on his work this evening and as you realise he's been working through a very heavy cold and uh, can I call it a gig last night in, in Edinburgh and uh, he's been talking for two hours and I think it was quite a remarkable achievement to have held your attention for, for that period. So thank you very much indeed, Professor Dawkins. Thank you, Paula, for conducting the conversation with Richard. I think you did it admirably. And thank you, Gary, for running the question and answers. I think many of you will realize that Gary was actually doing Good Morning Scotland this morning, so he's had a very long day coming up from Glasgow uh, to join us here, so thank you for that. Uh, this event is part of a three-part series we've planned. The next event will be our own Professor Andrew McGowan's inaugural lecture, 
Andrew is Principal of Highlands Theological College. That's one of UHI's 13 academic partners. And Andrew's lecture is entitled The Role of Theology in the University and will also be given here in Eden Court on the 10th of June at 7.30. As you've heard, uh, on the 27th of October at 4.30 here, uh, Dr. John Lennox, a reader in mathematics at Oxford University and a fellow of Green College, will deliver a lecture entitled, God's Undertaker Has Science Buried God? And tickets for this event are now available from the Eden Court box office, so you can pick them up if you so wish on the way out. Our thanks to Colin Marr and his colleagues in Eden Court for helping us to organize this event. Thanks too, as ever, to High, Highland Council, Fusion, and the Chamber of Commerce for their continuing support for our lecture series. The next lecture will be Professor Steve Brown from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, who will be joining us on the 16th of April in the executive office just along the road here on Ness Walk. And Professor Brown's lecture is entitled, Managing Our Fear of Failure. Finally, uh, Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, and other uh, copies of his uh, previous books are available to buy in the foyer, and Richard has agreed uh, to be available to sign copies for anyone who would so wish. And a stand has been set up uh, at the rear entrance to the theatre in the bar area. So there we are. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I hope you found it a stimulating and challenging event. That is, after all, what we expect a university to bring to Inverness and the Highlands and Islands. So I can ask you once again to thank Professor Dawkins.